Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pandemic Survival Guide for Residential Contractors. This is our 10th week of doing this. We have officially made it to the end of May. How about that? I think we all need to give ourselves yeah. a pat on the back for surviving this long, right? Yay. Yay. We did it. We did it. The end of the world has not come. That's right. <laughs> yet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. All right, so we got a good group for good group of you all today. We're just looking at our list of attendees. For those of you that haven't, there's a couple of names on here I don't recognize. Looks like we've got some new people. For those of you that don't know us, my name is Ed Earl, and I'm coming to you from San Diego, California. That just opened up our barber shops and uh, and our retail shops uh, this week. So I run a construction project management company here. In addition to being a business coach with these two gentlemen. And I also have an MBA from Stanford. So i uh, got a little yeah, bit yeah. of a experience and education background as well. So, Paul, how about you? Now, I have more experience for you. Not sure than both of you put together, but I've got 35 years of doing this, which makes you all die. And I've worked with hundreds of contractors over that time. Never seen this before. Hope to never see it again. And my master's is from Cal Poly, which isn't nearly as impressive. But... Um, it's, you know, every, it's, it's, I guess you could call it exciting. I mean, the excitement has almost got boring, right? I mean, you can only get excited for so long. And then you're going, is it, are we done yet? Are we done yet? <laughs> <laughs> you I know, I, 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 well, I, I, and the saying is, you know, when one door closes, something else opens. And I have to admit, I don't have an NBA. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't got it yet. Maybe I should say, I just haven't gone yet. But in the meantime, there there's so school. many things evolving in the marketplace. And we've tried to talk about, we'll continue to talk about what really we see novel or innovative contractors doing. The, the situation is what it is. So what can we do to adapt and move and lead people, our clients, uh, our prospective clients, our employees into this new time? What does it look like? Let's show them what it looks like. Let me give it back to you, Ed. Thanks, David. All right, and David, well, if you say the new normal one time, I'm going to punch you out. Well, it, it, <laughs> since we're in different places. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Enough. All right. I'll try, I'll try to muzzle myself on that one. All right. All right, well, it's it's time for my, my regular feature that I love to start off our webinars with, and that's another corny uh, uh, pandemic joke of the week, right? So this is my, for those of you that follow my Instagram account, which by the way is at the Zen Builder, you'll see that uh, I post these on my Instagram account as well. So my joke last week got a, got a bunch of likes. I don't know how, how this one's gonna do, so I'll try it out on you guys first. So the coronavirus has done what no woman has been able to do, Cancel all sports, shut down all bars, and keep all men at home. Ba -da -ba. There we go. Bada boom. All right. There we go. So the next. Well, you, you our, hear the our, one our next... Ed, about the woman that said that, you know, the good thing about the coronavirus is, you know, I've been able to stay home with my wife and hear what, hear what I've done wrong for the last 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that one, too. Uh, all right, well, let's move on to our other uh, regular feature of the, the webcast, which is uh, uh, showing you where and who can work. So the good news here is this thing has not changed in three weeks now, and hopefully it won't change except to start to see uh, that last red state disappearing and some of the green states going back to gray. So um, so anyway, but that's all, that's all good news, so uh, no changes on that. Um, let's go now to the, the loans because we've had some really exciting input here from the loans this week. Um, let's uh, raise your hands if you received money in your bank this week from the PPP program. Let's see how many people got money this week. Oh, we got some hands going up there. How about that? All right. Good. So uh, definitely people are still receiving money from the PPP. I think people are also receiving money from the EIDL, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, this was an interesting statistic that, that I found uh, this week on the PPP. 
So remember how the first round of the PPP went so fast, it was gone in like 13 days, 349 billion. Well, this second round, 310 billion, is going much sl more slowly. And as of when I saw this article, which I think was Tuesday, there was still $140 billion left in the PPP. So clearly, um, there's still money for those of you that haven't yet applied. You can see from the chart there now, we've gone from 38% to of the people that have received their funds on the week of April 26th to 67% now have received their money as of May 10th. So another thing that's I think kind of slowed this down as well is the average loan size. So during that first round of funding, remember we had all those huge companies getting those multi-million dollar loans. And so the average loan size was 206,000. This now in this second round, um, as of May 26th, it has dropped to 115,000. So almost half as large for the loan sizes. So that's good. All right, we have some really, really big news this week. Actually just came across yesterday. I'm really excited to share this with you. I see Diane Gilson's on here as well. Um, and I was actually gonna send something to you, Diane, but now I don't need to because um, if you haven't heard the news already, big, big uh, change yesterday. The House yesterday passed a bill to give more flexibility to the payroll protection plan. And this is gonna totally change the landscape. This is a big game changer. So the first thing is that it changes the forgiveness period from eight weeks to 24 weeks. So it triples the amount of time that you have to spend this money. So huge, huge. If you couldn't think that you could spend the money over that eight week period, now you have 24 weeks, basically six months to spend this money. So that now, I, I have a huge. question, Ed. So let's yeah. say I had eight I had eight weeks of payroll, right? So now right. in the same payroll, I can just keep going on and say I got like twenty five thousand dollars or something. Then that payroll can keep on going. Correct. So I have right. all that time to spend the money. So I'll spend way over than I more than I need to spend because I got twenty four weeks right. between that eight, right? So I got right. no problem with exactly. all the money. I think with these changes, if this passes, no one should have any trouble spending 100% of their money. Um, before I go through the rest of the changes, let me point out, I have this down at the bottom. So this passed the House yesterday with a 471 to one vote. Just uh, one, <laughs> one Republican from Kentucky was the lone holdout. I don't know if any of you are from the state of Kentucky. I don't know who Th Thomas Massey is, but uh, he was the one, the one holdout. And the state adjourned before Memorial Day, so the Senate did. So the Senate hasn't yet passed it, but it's now headed to the Senate and it's expected to pass. So this isn't law yet, but it sounds like it's, it's gonna be very soon. So in addition to extending the forgiveness period, the other huge change that this makes is it changed uh, the amount that has to be spent on payroll from 75% to 60%. So remember in the past, you could only do 25% of the total loan amount for other expenses. Well, now you can go up to 40%. So not only do you have you know, three times as long to spend the money, but now you can spend up to 40% of it on things outside of payroll. So, and then the third big change is it extends the time the business needs to make a good faith effort to rehire employees from June 30th now it's all the way out to the end of the year, December 31st. So those three changes are huge. And like you said, Paul, there's almost no, no excuse now for not being able to get 100% of your loan forgiven. So uh, another kind of subtlety of that as well is um, um, there's also, as part of the original CARES Act, there was an ability to defer certain payroll tax payments and they weren't gonna allow you to defer those if you use the PPP program. But now you can defer those, those payroll tax payments that you need to make, even if you have the PPP program. And then the last change, which is almost like unnecessary, I think, in my opinion, is that they've now extended the payback period. If you don't get your loan forgiven, um, 
it go, extends from two years to five years now. So you have five years to pay this money back at 1% interest. So, so let, me, let me go straight in. Yeah. So I calculated everything on eight weeks, right? Eight weeks of payroll. Right. 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 Now I have 24 weeks to spend the same amount of money. Exactly. How can I possibly not spend right? that amount of money? It's impossible. Right. I, you know, exactly. I mean, Right. I think what's going to happen now is people are going to come back and clamor and go, hey, I want more money. You know, can I reapply? Right. Now, what, what, what they haven't changed is that, as far as I know, and I would think they haven't, for that remaining amount of money that I said was still left, what was it, um, hundred and, what was it, $140 billion left, um, that's still based on uh, two and a half times your monthly payroll. So the the loan amount calculation hasn't changed. As far as I know, this isn't changing the loan no. amount. So for those of you that I'm, I get, yeah. I'm, a, I'm slow with math. So I have 24 <laughs> weeks to spend eight weeks worth of payroll. Correct. I think you've got it right. right. Yeah. <laughs> I, right. I, it doesn't make sense to me, but hey, I'm not the government. I have right. no idea why that makes I, sense. I, I think you call that a given. All right. Yeah. 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 So okay. anyway, so that's the, that's the huge news for this week. Again, it's not written in law yet. Uh, we'll have an update on our next webinar, but it seems like it's pretty much a, a, a foregone conclusion that it's, it's indeed going to happen. So when's it going in front of the Senate? Did you say? Uh, uh, it cleared I the house. believe it's, yeah, sometime next week. I don't know okay. when the Senate um, well, it, is coming if back. If something in. passes, if something passes, 400 and whatever, 100% of the House votes for it. There's yeah. no way the Senate's going to kill right. it. It's impossible. Exactly right. I mean, there was only one lone Republican, so I don't want to get political and I here. Assume, but maybe and I assume a few... Trump's going Trump's to sign it, right? That's a given, too. Right. right? Sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, all right. So that's the big news for the week. Um, another thing that happened between last week and this week was the SBA re released this, what's called, I love these long legalese things, interim final rule. Now, is that a contradiction in, in, in <laughs> final, terms or not? Final and, for today, but not tomorrow, right? Right? It's the interim <laughs> final rule requirements for loan forgiveness application. So this I document see. is 26 pages long. If you, any of you are having trouble with insomnia, I suggest you download it and Put it next to your nightstand. Oh my God, that's insane! Oh, crazy, crazy. Um, rather, if you want to help yourself, there is the link to it. You can go in there. It's the PPP interim final rules requirements. You click on the download. But PDF, none of that means none of that means it. anything because they're going to throw it all out. Correct. Right. Well, some of it. Some of it, yes. Some of it. You no. don't. You so don't know what they're going to throw out. What they're not going to throw out. Right. So right. Right. We have right. no idea. Right. Right. So if you don't want to read the 26 pages, there's, I found a really good summary in this Forbes article that came out on May 22nd, which was the day after they released this. I'm going to just quickly go through some of the information from that. So um, it's, um, they basically said that, um, that the loan forgiveness prepayments now would be extended beyond the eight-week period. Um, but again, that's what we had talked about now. That's all been, been uh, uh, probably will be changed. Another thing there was, uh, we had this lively discussion with a couple of participants last week after last week's call. He was, he was saying to me that he thought it was all or nothing. Like you had to spend 75% on payroll or none of it was forgiven. And this clarification that came out said that that wasn't the case. So now it's going to be the 60% instead of the 75%. So again, you have to spend 60% of it on payroll. But to Paul's point, now that you have 24 weeks instead of eight weeks, how can you not, how can you not spend it? So um, another interesting thing, which again was an issue until they extended this, Paul, you and I had talked about the fact that which basically are us and our wives. And so how are we going to spend that extra money? we talked about that we would charge a bonus and hazard pay. And this clarified this, and it, while it allows bonus and hazard pay for employees, it does not allow it for uh, owner's compensation. 
So for those of you that thought that you were going to pay yourself more in, in uh, hazard pay, I know, Diane, I think we had this conversation when we were speaking with you. Um, this, this clarification, this interim rule prohibits that. But again, given this new law. Does it matter if I have 24 front, weeks to spend it, right? It, no. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, and then there's this exclusion for reduction in employees. But this is, again, uh, this is where, you know, you just have to make a good faith to hire the employees back. And if they refuse, then you document that. But again, now, instead of having to do all of this by June 30th, you now have until December 31st. So. All right. Um, and then this was the last thing, which I thought was kind of interesting. They clarified and confirmed exactly what you had said, Paul, which is the the um, SBA does not is not giving the money to the banks until it is forgiven. So at this point, the money that's been given is being loaned by the banks. And then when the banks approve the forgiveness, they go back to the SBA and the SBA then pays the bank. The other thing well, that's I have a question for you, is, Ed. Yeah. So mm -hmm. where is the hundred and fifty billion dollars? I mean, they didn't use it, right? Right. Yeah. So it's sticking in some question, SBA Paul. checking account somewhere. I mean, because it, it, they right. didn't spend it. Right. Yeah. I don't know where I, it is. I don't know. Uh, but it's true. But it's not. It's not for the banks. And so the other thing too is, as as you said, Paul. You know, all the banks are getting five percent loan fees on all of these loans. And um, if a borrower is red is um, determined to be ineligible, they have to pay that 5% back. So the banks are really motivated here to want to make sure that, that, that they don't disqualify the borrowers because they're going to lose that, that 5% loan fees. So, and then the last thing, which is, is really important that doesn't change, and I want to emphasize this, we brought this up before, it's important that you keep all of your PPP documentation for six years. Even the stuff that you don't have to submit for your loan forgiveness. For example, you don't have to submit if you uh, offered a job to an employee and they refused and declined it. You don't have to submit that with your loan forgiveness application, but you do have to keep that in your PPP records and you need to keep that for six years. So that's really important to make sure you have good documentation and you're keeping all of those documents. So. Um, is your bank ready to ask, accept applications yet? This was something that I got from my bank this week. And it's really funny because uh, they said, you know, it's too early to apply for forgiveness. As soon as it's time, you'll receive an email. Well, now, obviously, with what's happened with this new bill, this is going to take even longer. So uh, I don't know if anyone else has received these emails from their bank saying they weren't ready to accept applications, but that was what no, I received. So let me get this straight. This means that nobody's going to probably apply for at least 24 weeks, right? What? Right. I mean, unless yep. you've already spent so, the money. I guess if you've spent the money, you could apply sooner, right? But for 24 weeks, where does that put it? Well, it depends on when you got the money, but, you know, yeah. like the earliest. Listen, May 1st. Of our clients, they got it May 1st. Say at May first, then you've got until what the end of July. I mean, the end of November. Uh, yeah, I was going to yeah, say basically. December one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Um, now, what I want to talk about is a lot of people, a lot of our clients this week got notification for EIDL approval. So. Let's see a show of hands. Raise your hand if you received EIDL loan approval this week. David, I know you did, right? Well, I didn't get the approval. I got, here's an application. So I right. can go in and complete an application, which surprised right. me because you didn't get that. Did you, Paul? No, they said, I'm in the same business as Ed is. So since Ed was eligible, I wasn't. Well, good. That's that's that, that, that's 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 clear. So that one, that's a, that's I'll try a, to figure out. A, yeah, yeah, that makes as much sense as the uh, temporary permanent solution, right? Yeah, yeah. Whatever the the limited earlier. final answer. Yeah. The limited exactly. final answer. Wow! Look at that, Stephanie, Renee, Marcos. Man, a lot of you got the EIDL approvals this week. All right, we know. Um, uh, we were actually talking to to Stephanie about this yesterday. So let me go through, because for some of you, 
you may go, gosh, do I really want this loan? You know, do I really need this money? And um, let me go through the difference between the EIDL and the PPP. Um, one of the attendees that I was talking to after our webinar last week, he was making the argument that he thinks the EIDL is actually a better loan than the PPP. And um, the reason for that is a couple of things. One is that you, you don't have to pay anything for the first 12 months instead of the first six months with the PPP program. The other thing is that the PPP is only a two-year program, although now with this new legislation- Soon to be six be or five, five, right? Years. Yeah, right. Um, where the EIDL is a 30-year loan. So um, as far as the, the maximum loan amounts, you know, the EIDL was originally 2 million, but they now have this new limit of 150. So, um, that's we we actually have one of our clients right jose in uh, in new orleans he applied so early on he got what five hundred thousand, paul right yeah i got no, yeah. yeah right but everyone else that we know like mike's mike at triple uh, a he applied for two million he only got 150 so pretty much now the most you can get is 150. but for many of you to qualify for a loan a hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan at this kind of an interest rate, you know, again, remember the old adage with banks, banks only lend you the money once you've proven that you don't need it. So, and I'm telling you, you know, we don't know where this is going. Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this pandemic reality check in the next few slides, but we is don't know. Is that the new normal, Ed? Is that, is that what Paul yeah. was referring you, to? Yeah. Yes, you <laughs> 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 Uh, what's your chance uh, in my hands? That's all uh, I have to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is the new normal. So my advice is, look, and this is what we've told some of our clients, I would take the loan. If there's any chance that you could possibly need it, you know, unless you're really well capitalized, look, I've got a, a line of credit that I can draw down on at, at four and a quarter percent. So it's not that much different than the three and a, three and three quarters. I'm probably not going to take my loan because, and I was able to work some things out with my, uh, my, my, my mortgage and some other things I might, won't get into. But for me, I'm not, I'm not going to probably take that loan. But I think for many of you out there, I think it m makes sense. So I, our recommendation is to, to really look at it. If you're in a position where you wouldn't be able to borrow that amount of money, even six, eight months from now, you know, Paul, we, we talked about this uh, this week with one of our clients, right. you know, well, it, if you it don't, be, right? it's, it's, an yeah. un it's an unsecured loan, right? Yeah. So right. it's right. sort of like, it's like, you know, what is the Federal Reserve going to do if they call the note? There's nothing to foreclose on. So there's nothing, if they loan you the money, it's insecure, unsecured. So they can't get anything other than they maybe give you a bad credit rating, but there's no... Yeah. It's totally unsecured, right? Well, and you can see here under collateral required, it says possibly depending on the loan amount. So I think maybe for some of those bigger loans, you know, with yeah. some of those were issued for the larger ones, they might have had collateral. I'm pretty sure our client that had the 500000 though, didn't ask for any collateral. No. And for all of these newer loans, 150000 or less, they're not asking for any collateral. So it's like if so you can get the money, if you can get the money, why not? And right. to clarify, you can get both the PPP and apply for the EIDL. Correct. You can and do it's both. Correct. It's, it's, and, right. and it may, you may be familiar with the concept of hard debt and soft debt. I mean, hard debt is they come and take your house and your firstborn child, right? You, they've got collateral. Soft debt is to your mother-in-law. She may be pissed off, but she's not going to foreclose on your house. So I would consider this soft debt because there's... Right nothing they can do other than maybe give you a bad credit rating if you don't pay it back and getting right. that kind of money which is soft debt if you went out on the open market it would cost you for that kind of loan 10 to 15 percent if you wanted an unsecured trust me i'll pay it back business loan with nothing but your good name it's 15 percent yeah yeah Hard money. Yeah, that's true. And the other thing, too, is how easy it is to apply. If you were on the website last week, on our webinar last week, I showed you how literally you click on this link and you just slide the bar to, to show how much you want to borrow and it shows you what your monthly payment is. 
and they verify your identification, you fill out the loan documents, and it's that simple. So you literally do it all through the SBA website. You never have to go to a bank. It's not like the PPP, right. which is done through an actual bank. So, And the, the only people I would recommend that don't do it, if you're going to do it and go buy a boot, new boat or a new car or you know, something like that, and you can't trust yourself with the money, don't take it. But if you're fiscally right. responsible and you're going to use it for your business and you're not going to go spend it on some thing that doesn't make any sense, then I'd get the money. Good. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I've got a related PPP question. Can I throw that out, Ed? Yes, please do. Because so, uh, Elena, on, but I want to talk about it. Elena posted that you quickly went past one of the last few slides. I saw towards the bottom that there was a limit you could attribute to each employee's salary towards forgiveness to the amount they made last year to only eight weeks worth of their salary they made last year. So is there a limit per employee? So I believe this is the slide that she's talking about, right? So um, the limit here that this is talking about is the $100,000 limit right that you can't pay uh someone more than a hundred thousand dollars and that's where this fifteen thousand three eighty five works out to be because this is eight fifty seconds of a hundred thousand dollars so uh um, but and if that, that, if that far extended to 12 finish. weeks then if that extends to 24 that's all that's off right right exactly exactly so you still write. You, you, so I, I would think this is really based more on the fact of your your qualifying amount of your loan um, and the fact that it's you know two and a half times your monthly payroll with it capped for anyone that made over a hundred thousand and has to be capped at the fifteen thousand three eighty five. So all right. Um, I um, after the webinar I go through the the questions and if any of you have questions that we haven't yet answered. I'll go ahead and send you an email with answers to the questions. So, all right, well, let me give you a little bit more of a, we just kind of wanted to touch bases here on, on the pandemic reality check, right? This is, this is was all of us, and I think including the three of us, you know, when this all started three months ago, oh, you know, this is gonna go away soon. It's gonna be a blip in the economy. It's not gonna be a big deal. This is the reality now today, right? It's not going away anytime soon. This was an article that uh, was posted, uh, I think it was last week. The NAHB chief economist now predicts a sharp recession to come. And so that's pretty much um, a, 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 a reality. Uh, this I thought was interesting this week. I found the, the bottom 10, these are the cities that are worst positioned to recover from the coronavirus. Detroit, Michigan, Honolulu, Hawaii, Los Angeles, California, McAllen, Texas, Miami, Florida, New Haven, Connecticut, New York City, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Stockton, California, and Tampa. Why is Stockton? Stockton huh. and Tampa, I'm not sure. I, you can see the other, the other uh, commonality of all of these is that they're all large, highly dense metropolitan areas. Yeah. So, right. And, and, and Hawaii uh, depends was, on tourism, it, so I can see that. Right. Right. And then this was in a Forbes article. These are the 10 cities best positioned to recover from the coronavirus. Boise, Idaho, Denver, Colorado. There you go, David. Durham, go. Durham North Carolina, Madison, Wisconsin, Provo, Utah, Raleigh, North Carolina, Salt Lake City, Utah, San Jose, California. They specifically pointed out how well positioned Silicon Valley is. Tucson, Arizona, and Washington, D.C. So I uh, thought that was very, very interesting. Um, here's a, another article that came out this week in, in Hive, um, and um, it was about staying optimistic. It was an interview, actually, with this CR hero from uh, Meritage Homes, and he brought up you know, several positive points. The fact that I think we've all seen this, the fact that home sales have turned positive, that home prices are actually increasing by 6.2% over the last month. So clearly people are realizing that homes are important and they want to improve their health and well-being 
and they're willing to spend the money on it. And his last point in this article too was, look, we can use this to improve. We need to use this as an opportunity to improve not only how we design our houses to make them safer, to make them more sanitary, but also the way that we build and construct the houses, the technology that we use both inside of, of the house itself, as well as in the process of building the house, and how we educate our buyers on the importance of all of the features that are, that are present in a healthy home. Uh, another thing that I wanted to bring up today as well is, and another bit of positive good news, uh, someone brought this up to me uh, this week, which is, you know, with summer vacations put on hold, there's a lot of households out there that maybe have socked away 10, 20, whatever thousand dollars that they were planning to use on their big summer European trip this summer, and they're not going to. So now what do you do with that $20,000? Well, hey, maybe we're going to go ahead and remodel part of our house. And also realizing, too, that with social distancing being the new norm, homeowners are wanting to make improvements to adapt to this new reality, right? Since they're not going out to restaurants as much, hey, let's upgrade our kitchen. Uh, they're realizing that even into the future, they're going to be working at home for much longer. So let's, let's uh, fix up that old bedroom we have and make it a home office. A home gym, even when the fitness centers open back up, there's obviously going to be some risk of infection there. People might prefer to work out in their own home gym than to, to be at a gym. And the same thing with the theater. Once the movie theaters open up, you, well, you know what, let's just stay at home. Let's not take the family out tonight and run the risk of getting infected. We'll just stay home and watch the movie on our big screen at home. So I think those are all really positive impacts and things that we can do to be able to see where we can go here and realize that despite all of the adversity and all of the difficulties and all of the uncertainties that we, we don't know about and all of the things we've talked about in this, this series to date, it is important to realize that you, you have to stay positive and optimistic about the long term. So with that, I am going to, um, and that's our, our same summary slide that we've talked about, and again, the importance of, of being optimistic in, in the long term. Um, questions, again, as uh, if you have any questions, please call us or email us. Um, this is all of our contact information. We make sure to get back to everyone that either calls us or emails us uh, as quickly as we can to get any, any answers to you. So also I wanted to announce, we're gonna make a little change in this webinar. We've been doing this now every week for the last 10 weeks. And we've now decided what we're gonna do is we're gonna to switch to a bi-weekly format. Um, and so we're gonna be doing this every other Friday. So, um, so our next, our next uh, webinar is going to be on June 12th. So we will look forward to seeing you all on June 12th. Uh, my son is actually graduating next Friday, June 5th, which was part of our reason for not doing it next week. Uh, for those of you that have uh, graduating seniors, uh, what they're doing here in San Diego is they've rented out the parking lot for Petco Park, our baseball stadium, and we're going to have a drive-in graduation. So each family is, is allowed to bring two cars, and we're all going to pull into the parking lot of Petco Park Stadium. The stadium is putting up these giant 40 foot widescreen TVs, and we're gonna have the virtual graduation ceremony with everyone in their cars down at Petco Park on the big screen. Wow. So, Drive-in movies are gonna come back. You wait and see. Yep, yep. That's a creative solution, yeah. Yep. So, all right, well, thank you all so much for, for joining us. We had a great, great group here. Nice attendance today. And uh, stay safe, stay positive, and we'll look forward to talking to you again on June 12th. All right. Take care, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bye-bye.